welcome to another edition of Quanta Cafe. This is a, an opportunity for me to have conversations with engineering leaders from around the world. My name is uh, Paul Gilbert and uh, I work for Quanta. I'm the CEO of Quanta and we've been partnering with uh, the academic world in engineering education and research for over 30 years now in the field of mechatronics, controls and robotics. And I am absolutely uh, Delighted to have with me an old friend, Dr. Ramiro Jordan from the University of New Mexico. Welcome, Ramiro. How are you doing? Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Hang yeah, in here. I have the you hanging in there. We have the distinct. I have the distinct pleasure of being able to travel around the world uh, to to meet people like Ramiro, and have done for, for for many years. And I can tell you that Ramiro has so many. Uh, what can I say? Um, arrows in his quiver. He has so, so done so much and he's got so much to talk about. We're not going to be short of a few things to, to discuss, but let me just introduce him a little bit more formally. He's uh, currently, and I say that because I can't really keep track of the number of positions he is, but he's currently the Associate Dean at, at the Engineering Program in New Mexico, affiliated with the ECE department. And he has been the Associate Chair of ECE um, and uh, involved in their undergraduate programs and, and graduate programs for many years. His background, uh, originally from Argentina, I believe. Is, is, is that correct, uh, Romero? I did his I, I, was in born, I was born in Bolivia, but I studied in Argentina, correct? That's right. Born in Bolivia and studied in Argentina. And he got his uh, master's and PhD from Kansas State University. But really, uh, he's got uh, well over 25 years of experience creating and leading STEM education initiatives, working with R&D and entrepreneurial organizations, and, and, and done a lot of work specifically in the Latin American, also the Ibero-American uh, part of the world. Um, he's a leader in international engineering education research. He's committed and very accomplished with entrepreneurial partnerships, raised tons of money and worked with all kinds of organizations, um, spin-offs from universities, spin-offs from R&D programs. A couple of uh, associations that he started or was involved in starting is tech the ibero american science and technology education consortium he's the founder and director executive director from 1990 to 2000 and still works with them very active with them he's taken what he's learned there to participate and start ifes which is the international federation of engineering education societies um, taking lessons from latin america taking them global um, he's advised the united nations the national science foundation and has a very, very strong philosophy in terms of education, where he believes that recent education go hand in hand. And these experiences, research style experiences should be built into the undergraduate uh, world so that, that this knowledge can pass on and challenge students. Um, and I think that's probably a, a, a good place to start. Um, but before we get into you know, the undergraduate programs and engineering education, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and what got you interested in engineering in the first place, Romero? Okay. Well, that's a good question, and thank you for asking it. Um, I Okay, I, I'm departed from the rest of the family. My family was always in the, into uh, law or economics, uh, and I said, nah, this is not for me. I wanted to, I wanted to solve problems, uh, create, things to solve problems that people needed. Uh, I was born in Bolivia, a very, very poor country that needed everything. I mean, from water systems, energy systems, I mean, telecom, of course. So this is what got me into engineering. I had I saw so many problems and said, how do I come up with solutions? And 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 right off the beginning, I knew I wanted to be electrical en electrical engineer. But at that time, it was uh, telecommunications and engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, I think you, I remember you telling me back in that time, telecommunications in Latin America was very rudimentary. Right? How does that compare to, to, to the way it is today? What, what? Give us some examples of some of the things you dealt with back in your early days of telecommunications. Oh boy, this is interesting. Uh, when I started ISTIC in 1990, I was here in the U.S. and uh, wanted to create a, a network for collaboration among different uh, universities in Latin America. Recall 1990, the internet was beginning to be built up even That's in the right. U.S. and Europe. Yeah. So there was no internet whatsoever in Latin America. So 
this is one of the challenges, one of the first challenges when we created ISTIC is, uh, let's bring the internet. And, and this is one of the projects that we started. And here yeah. at UNM, I mean, I created the uh, the courses to on the internet, on computer networks, uh, undergrad and graduate program, because at that time, uh, with a colleague and some students, we created a software company. As a, it was called Chorus, and then we came up with a graphical programming language that now is used uh, by MATLAB, Simulink, LabVIEW. They took our technology, so because it was open <laughs> systems, at that time. Our server was ranked the seventh most busiest uh, machine on the internet. We were doing the internet. Um, we yeah, at it's, the time... it's, it's, it, I, sorry, it's, it's interesting to, to to know what the research facilities you have on campus there. I mean, it's a shout out to the University of New Mexico, your claim to fame. What what what's the name of the research facility down there? Oh, my lab at that time it was called the Chips and Salsa Lab. Chips, we did the <laughs> hardware. And, uh, and salsa was the software. At that time, we were big into supercomputing uh, with Cray Research. And we had, of course, access to uh, Los Alamos and Dia Labs. And with Cray Research, we were doing very heavy computing in the climate area, already climate change. And uh, through ISTEC in 1991, 92, we helped create the first supercomputing center of Latin America. And this was done at the uh, Universidad Autónoma de México, the UNAM. Uh, and that was the first supercomputer in all Latin America. And we trained uh, a lot of uh, scientists and, and, and of course, researchers and students. And mm -hmm. it was funny because some of the trainers were my students <laughs> that were training. That's, that's that. But this is interesting. This is your philosophy all the way along is you bring research and bring real life problems into the undergraduate education program. So remind me, I've lost track of the number of universities or students that you've impacted over the years. You came out with some statistics years ago that you yeah. told me. But... Yeah, through ISTEC because we had many initiatives. I mean, everything started here at UNM, like the Y lab that we started with you. And then we replicated that. So we had several labs. Uh, that, and that most of the equipment were donated by like Motorola, Microsoft, HP and all of that. And we donated well over 500 labs, uh, you know, software and hardware labs. And through those labs and, and, and over 15 years, we probably touched half a million people. And that's the impact. Yeah. And again, demystified research, right? Like you said, we didn't get, need, it, need to bring this well, down you, you, to you, real you, people. Yeah, but you, you, you yeah, you bring in the research to students, undergraduate students, so they get excited. And then from those half a million, from those 500 labs, countless startups have, have oh. kicked off. Little, little companies have kicked off. And and so, so so this has been something I remember meeting you in Brazil the first time we met. And, and we both had a kind of similar passion to make kids come to life and enjoy engineering. And, and, and I think you're... Your comment to me was, "Let's go make some trouble happen." Something along those lines. You know, oh was, yeah, let's have, uh, let's make a difference and have fun, right? It's let's it's about <laughs> playing, right? I mean, having fun. I, I think we we need to make things fun. Uh, I strongly believe that we need to empower the the, uh, the young engineers the, the first semester, first year, because and as they get into the program, it becomes so rigorous. All we kind of dampen their creativity and innovation because they're of the rigor and we can't allow that to happen we got to keep that seed alive and this is what I'm, i always wanted to do in the undergraduate program come on guys create innovate you know have fun and of course you have to take these classes and and give a purpose why are you taking these classes so yeah. again this is the origin of the y lab right why am I taking so what this are the class? Kind of thing, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what, 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 are the, what are the kind of things that you introduce to first year students? Because I, I know at UNM, you're pretty much ahead of the game. You, you, you make sure the students are, are active and engaged from, from day one. What are the kind of, kind of problems or kind of things that you throw at them in the first year, in addition to obviously the learning, the base of the math concepts and theories that they have to go through? Yeah, so, uh... I think this has been enhanced because of COVID-19. Uh, we come up with projects that are 
have community impact. Uh, so be aware of, of your community. I mean, we tell our students that they have to be street smart, okay? So they need to function outside in the street and not be hit by the first bicycle or car. They need to be aware of the, what the community needs. And now, I mean, uh, back to COVID, New Mexico, we have the biggest labs, national labs in, in the US, a lot of researchers. And then we have the Navajo Pueblo, north of us, who, who had, were dying because of COVID. They had no water, no electricity, no telecom. How can we, this is at home. So it, that problem was in our faces. And we, mm -hmm. and, and, and we reacted too late. I mean, we should have done something uh, early on and help these communities. So this is what the kind of problems that I always like to bring since I started uh, working here at UNM is look at the community. What is it that they need? I mean, New Mexico is uh, very diverse. We have 24 different pueblos and of course the Hispanic and the black communities and all that. And there's a lot of needs. And I think engineering is to solve problems for those communities. And I know you find out when those students do make it into, into UNM, they're really keen to, to work on these practical projects that, that, that you have. And then we've done, I know we've worked with you over the years on a number of capstone projects um, where we've taken some of our technology and some of our, our uh, you know, software capabilities and your students have come together and created some, some amazing things. Um, which of those would you describe as, as, let's say, your favorite project? Because you've done a bunch of them with us. So which of those capstone projects did you enjoy? Oh boy, that's that's a hard one. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the helicopter was something that we thought we couldn't do it, but all of a sudden, these come the students and they develop this uh, virtual environment around the helicopter. Then with the QDEX, that was a challenge, and people got excited about that. The, Paul, the students are bright; they're much smarter than I am or Eric and all of us. All we do is give them the tools, and they fly. You know, and then uh, with the drone, the Y lab. I mean, what what the students did this year. I mean, connected Unreal environment, we creates a a, a virtual reality uh, cage for the drones that people can fly, and we can connect that virtual reality to the real drone cage, and people can actually fly the drones. And the reason we did this is because lockdown right people couldn't come to the yeah. lab so now people can fly their drones from whatever and uh, as long as you have good bandwidth and uh, what's important what they, these students did is also develop the a, a course on how to fly the drone and make sure they don't crash the drone right hit the roofs <laughs> or the walls or yeah. so it's it, all the safety component and, and this was and this is something that Eric and I, all we can do is, yes, encourage them. I don't have the time to dive into the so, technology. So it's, 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 it's amazing. When you sent me the video, I couldn't believe it because I was actually unaware that this project was taking place. I knew you had the drones and then you, these undergraduate students, I think everyone listening should actually get a, get a sense of this. These undergraduate students undergraduate. took this hardware and they created a simulated environment where they can control the simulated environment in the same way that they're controlling the physical devices. Correct. They did this during lockdown. They were separated from each other. And what they produced was absolutely incredible. It, it, it literally blew me away when I, I saw that. Um, and, and, and I was thinking of other projects you've done in the past. And, and, and the essence, if I may, is this notion of creativity, some open-ended problems. Because one of the ones, which is my favorite, is the dancing inverted pendulum. Oh, that so one too. Had, yeah. <laughs> Remember the inverted pendulum where they, yeah, you're, yeah. essentially you're balancing a, a pencil on the end of an arm and you're controlling the motor. And, and, and we got those students or the students came up with the idea to figure out how can you get that pendulum to dance to the music? And I think it was a Bob Marley song that they yeah. ultimately got it to. And then they created this crazy video, which uh, if anyone listening <laughs> wants to search, I don't know how to search it, but we'll, we'll find it and make it available because I think, the essence of that project and, and, and the drone project and the QDEX, which is creating content in, for a mobile platform, that is all open-ended, if you like, minimal constraints to get the creativity out of the students. And you typically have three or four 
students in a team. Um, and, and, and what do you think the students get most? Obviously they do the, the, the te te technical side of it, but what are the, the values that your students get out of those kinds of activities? First of all, they're challenged. They're, they have to do a lot of research. And also the, when they graduate, it, they put this in their resume, they get hired big time. I mean, this is the problem that we have. We have several students in the Y lab, they're playing with the drones and you know concert equipment. And all of a sudden we have the labs that come and get our students and they snatch them from us. You know, we can't pay that that well, right? So that's that's a benefit for them, not for us. But uh, for instance, the, the the three students that worked on the drone and Unreal Engine, two of them, one is going to uh, she's going to MIT, the other one is going to Cornell, and the the third student is staying here for her graduate program. I mean, this helps oh, them. Wow. This helps wow. them, uh, you know, move on, right? And this is this is awesome. I mean, well, that's 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 the that's the, the, the that's gonna be icing on the cake for you is to get someone to go to MIT or they get another lab to come in. I was thinking about this this notion of people coming in uh, and taking taking your well trained students. Uh, there should be some kind of transfer fee like there is in the football world. And when I say football, <laughs> I'm talking about soccer, you know, because I'm soccer, familiar. yeah, that's the one. So, you know, where you have a contract and they've actually got to pay you to take them away and they pay their salary as well because you've that trained them be. up to a certain. I, I would love that as well. Every, every now and again, that happens to our engineers as well. And, you know, and, and, and I, I'm very happy for them, you know, but big big companies will, will uh, come in and take them. And we've done a really good job in yeah. training them to get there. But uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, the COVID a couple of times or the pandemic has helped kind of you rationalize or make things crystallize for you. What are the things that you think of kind of maybe come to the fore during COVID, which you want to keep going or build on? Post We're building COVID. up uh, we something that we we started with my colleagues and I have a great colleague and he was my student that now he's he graduated so now it's my colleague. Uh, we just come up with interesting ideas and what we did this time and also in senior design is we teamed up with universities around the world. So we have a project with UAD, um, University, American University and, and, and United Emirates. And we have a project started on desalinization of water. Okay, wow. so they build parts there. We build the electronics here, the control, and they, they have to work remotely. We have another project. Oh, with, so, sorry, 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 you're saying that's an internationally oriented undergraduate project senior design exactly and and that potentially will can be a product that's where we we have another project with the university of, of texas in dallas some of these projects continue on right yeah. so th this project that we did with the drones this is phase one we will add phase two more complex so we don't want those, some of those projects to come to an end this is what industry yes how it works yes. right yeah. Yeah. so you take a project and you pass it down the line so this is what we want so the project uad the other project is with ut dallas is that a firefighter project okay so we have we're developing a awareness map with sensors put in the in the firemen so we can keep track of their health statistics because we need to pull them out we don't want them to get hurt or heart attack okay so all the sensing the awareness map that's a senior design project that will turn into product what we did now is another project related to creating a database on water systems and we take teamed up with the epix pe people in purdue so they right. have farmed out like 12 students around the world that work with my students here in, in New Mexico and develop the database and collect all these solutions in a database that, but it's a database with cured data. So people in the developing world can reach, go to this database and pick the right solution for, the, for their context. We're not trying to push technology. And this is something that we also tell our students, we can't just throw technology, up, you know, and solve no, a problem. No. You have to look at, give a meaning to technology. If the technology has no meaning, don't waste time.
Right. So, so this is this is really interesting. I mean, this this theme has come up time and time again in these Quanta Cafe conversations, where you want students to understand what what's the application, what the various concepts which may be heavy in math or but are very complicated, and why am I learning all this stuff, and how do I make that apply? How do you bring those projects? I mean, you just talked about a couple of fascinating projects. I mean, the the firefighting sensing outfit is is something which I think is really interesting or would be for a first or second year student. Do you bring these examples into your classes when you're teaching uh, concepts right. in the early years? Yeah. So th we this is why we created the, the Y Lab. The Y Lab is a playground and we invite people to come in from semester one until they graduate. And not only that, they're, now we got graduate students doing research with us, but this, it's okay. So it's a playground. So students from the first semester get to meet graduate students and they get sucked in and to research so we're demystifying all this it, it, we're making we're making it fun that's the, that's the main reason and then they get to connect you know the killer courses are calc one through three because you don't know what right. the heck you're learning and for what why right yeah or why right so so if you if we bring them to the lab and we say here's the you know these you learn this in physics this is how it works here so the wine lab it's it, i mean we don't they don't take credits it, but we're lecturing on, on all these matters on physics and math chemistry and they're constantly in the wine lab people are being exposed to different uh you know concepts so it's, so, so it's interesting so so you you mentioned the fact that you don't use it for credits so how do you get the students invited in there i mean this is on their own time or do you give them class time to go in there like how do you how do you structure it some classes have to come through the Y lab and we run experiments for them. Uh, and then and then that Y lab is always open. So we welcome people. Well, we will open again. It was open right <laughs> now. Of course, yeah, yeah. But uh, we will open again the door so people to just hang hang in there. Okay. And they they bring a problem and Eric and I or some other faculty would say, okay, what what you want to share something and we talk about it and 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 demystify that or help them with you know go look at this and all of that we don't solve their problems we just point them in the right direction and that's that's what we do and if they have a project this is the place this is the playground there's the 3d printers the instrumentation the drones you know all the equipment that from Quanza is there and other equipment we have software defined radios and and, and people get to play with it so, so I want to just kind of pause on this because this concept is something which I think is fundamental to your approach. And I think it's something that other people could really learn from. I heard this long lecture years ago and they described the notion of you know, little kids, you know, toddlers learning is a full body experience. They're out in the garden, they're playing and they've got their, yeah. you know, their, 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 the bucket, the sand and all the cars and it's a full body experience. So you go to high school and it's kind of waist up. You know they're sitting down in their classroom right and then you come to university and it's just and kind of up, right yeah. it's, it's only only your brain is supposed to function and that kills everyone's enthusiasm and you've got this kind of philosophy which says show them some interesting stuff show them some interesting research applications and let them go play and figure out how it makes sense so it's it, it's actually pretty radical when you think about it from an academic standpoint you're not boxing them in to to tell them exactly what they have to do how did the rest of the faculty because you you're you are known for being a little bit creative and that's a compliment uh, <laughs> um, uh, how did you get the other people to buy into this idea in the first place not everybody buys into this okay Th this is the problem with academia the silos and the ego you know <laughs> you got to leave your ego be outside if you want to play with the y lab your ego out and yeah. some people have that ego and they want their own lab. No, no, it's not about having, our lab is open to anybody. We invite people from other, we, people from the arts, uh, the film media people, because Netflix is big here. So there, there's a lot of Netflix uh, type of uh, contracts being done. And so they come to the white lab, people from civil engineering, biology, it's open for everybody. And with those people, it's great to collaborate with my colleagues inside ece some of them are good want to play some of them say uh, -uh it's not my lab i want my lab eh, whatever 
yeah it's, it's but, but, but you have but you've got like a number of years we've been working with you on this lab for what five six years maybe seven right. years i can't remember exactly and, and you've had dozens or hundreds of students have gone through it what's the feedback you get from students who've graduated and gone on to work do they ever come back and talk to you about it they love it this is they said this is where we learn the most right in the lab that's it and especially <laughs> if see if all the senior design projects that are have some connection with the Y lab are very successful, extremely successful, and they get, and like I said, they get recruited quickly by students because yeah, they've done awesome. something. They've and done they, something, and they, and they have skills that they're able to demonstrate that they, that, that, that they have. And to talking to which, and we've talked about this in the past. Are you? thinking about putting those kind of skill certification elements into into uh, UNM teaching? I think so. That's, this is something that uh, we're going to do. Uh, and we're creating, um, we're doing something very radical. So we have created officially now a new program. It's called Peace Engineering, OK? Right which is the convergence of science, technology, engineering, the arts, the humanities, social science, and the health sciences. So we're teaming also up with the health sciences. And, and the lab will be, of course, the Y lab, okay? And we wanna bring people uh, to talk about real issues that deal with peace engineering. And peace engi engineering, the engineering part is not about engineering, it's about all the disciplines that need to converge and come together, and we need to do a re-engineering of everything, okay? Mm -hmm. The world has been challenged. We see the pandemic as the first warning, and what's interesting, in the conference we organized that you guys participated in 2018, we had a, a panel from the National Labs, Los Alamos and Dia, and in one of those panels, they predicted the flags were out there that a pandemic was a Mm -hmm. shortly to come i don't know if you were in that and the, the audience there and everybody said out oh, these guys you really <laughs> and this was november of 28 20 uh, 19, 18. by december 2019 we have it okay and the flags were yeah. there so so it's about the 17 sdgs of the united nations we need to educate people in all these topics so we have created a peace engineering minor at UNM, and we're working mm -hmm. with the uh, graduate to create a peace engineering graduate program. The national labs have embraced peace engineering, and they're part of peace engineering program. So we have a network of universities, national labs, and companies that are helping us to create the peace engineering biome. And this is where we're going to talk about real problems that exist in the world. And, and and from semester one until they graduate, they have to work on projects that have an impact with the community. And, and these the, the, the and these are these are projects which are related, as you said, to the SDG goals. So it could be around climate, it could be around clean water, right. it could be a cradle water. to grave, you know. Yeah. And, We're and, doing and, and, that peace know, finance. How do you finance peace? So we have people from Stanford lecturing on on financing peace. So we invited people from all over uh, you know, the world. And we made them, we gave them a letter of academic title at UNM. So they are uh, faculty and we're gonna launch this biome in the fall. And I would love to invite you guys to be here. It'll be a face-to-face. -face. Well, yes. I remember, you know, I remember you, you, I mean, you've been talking about peace engineering to me for, for a number of years. 2018 was obviously the, the, the conference that you held in Albuquerque. And and I remember there you had people from all over the world and there were some amazing speakers that talked about the true value of what peace engineering is. And and now, you know, you're involved and in, let's take this global a little bit. You're involved in IFES. Correct. So you've been bringing this to IFES. So, what, so first of all, maybe describe IFES a little bit, the International Federation. Uh, I'm not sure if you're still the president or you're just the most recent past president, but what what's the goal of IFES as, as, as a group? And, and how do you think that the uh, peace engineering kind of movement has been influenced by, by you and those people? Um, well, uh, IFES is the International Federation of Engineering Education Societies. It's like a, the UN of engineering education societies. I was until 
last November, the, the president of IFIS and the past president. So uh, when we organized the conference, we wanted to challenge the world or to start thinking about peace, okay? Because peace and sustainability go hand in hand, okay? Yep. If you, you cannot have a sustainable planet if you don't leave it peace. So, so, and peace is a verb. So that was the challenge. And also we challenged the, the national labs. That was one of the things. The birth of big science was Los Alamos here in New Mexico. And since, so we ch said, okay, let's work on peace now. So this is why the labs embrace peace. And all of a sudden, it, the outcome of that conference was whoa everybody was just energized said oh, there's hope i want to keep it engaged and, you know the takeaways as i remember saying well the homework is you got to do something and we got to work mm -hmm. something so the outcome was that now we have a peace engineer consortium working on that and we use IFES and, and gdc to push and disseminate activities on peace engineering and curricula change we're not doing, I don't think we're educating the right engineers, okay, or professionals, because they're not out, they're not global citizens. They don't know what's happening in the world. Thanks to COVID, I mean, this is the good thing about COVID, it's sh shaking everybody. Every model, mm -hmm. every system has to be re-engineered. The financial, the, the supply chains, the health system, the everything has to be revisited because it's not working. What's on the rise is what inequality, yeah, poverty, absolutely. and violence. Yeah. I mean, come on, this, this, these are problems that can be solved, and we need engineers to solve these, you know. And so that's the call. And so we have uh, through IFIS GDC, I think peace engineering has, is there to, and is sticky, and people are thinking about it, and we will continue to disseminate. But you know, I like to walk my talk, so. Uh, creating the peace engineering biome here, New Mexico. And then the program that you've had, that, sorry, that you're putting in, into place at UNM, is that drawing from people from different parts of the campus, different parts of the university? Like who, who else is involved outside of engineering? Uh, business school, the arts and sciences, sociology, uh, uh, anthropology. Uh, we can't do it all. I mean, and then of course, a uh, gamut of other universities that, that will, will come and uh, so their courses will be accepted here. What we teach here will be accepted at other universities. So UC Boulder, Purdue, Drexel, Stanford right. Innovation Lab. So I'm really fascinated by the whole notion of peace engineering and what you're doing at the school because it's bringing all these people together. Are you working with, um, in this particular instance, are you working with universities in, 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 in other parts of the world? I mean, you've talked about the US. But in Africa, the Middle East, you know, are there universities that you're aligning with to to kind of build this program? Yes, we reached out. We we started well off with other universities, even in Canada, in, in, in Toronto. Uh, but it, because of COVID, it cut kind of died down. But we're going to pick that up again. But right now, we have uh, universities in Colombia and Argentina, Brazil. We have reached out to the Netherlands, so we have some schools mm -hmm. there, uh, Africa. Uh, so, uh, but th because of COVID, you know, it's it's a small group, but we still meet. So, it, what's interesting that since November 2018, as an outcome of that conference, the people that want to join uh, the, this peace movement, we have met every week. We meet every week, every Friday. And you have, we okay. have created so much content and synergy. So, you know, we have people from Wall Street and finance talking about financing peace. Really? How do you create these, uh, how do you find this capital? The S ESG funds, how do you, so it's, I'm learning so much. I'm humbled by the people that I have met. And, and, wow. And, that's the, that's the, for me the peace engineering it's it's amazing the amount of people that con constantly they want to join us well this you know this this year has been as you know it's been it's been, it's been one for the ages where where things were slowed down paused and stopped you know we, we're hopefully going to be back on track within three six months from now 
you know, we're a little bit behind you in Canada, but we're catching up fast in terms of vaccinations. So Good. we'll definitely be working working with you to kind of further the Y Lab, further its integration with the Peace Engineering Program. But before we kind of end the conversation, when we talk about your know, remote teaching or, or virtual labs that, that, that are available um, and you know recorded uh, lectures, which which have come a long way during this COVID period, what are the things that you want to keep? as part of the program are there elements that you've used in this last 15 16 months that weren't really used very much before um, which are the areas that you'd like to see continue i think uh remote access or teaching or access to information is here to stay it's going to be a hybrid model and a, and the other good thing about that is now it's a global model like mm -hmm. we have senior design projects with other universities around the world that will expand that will increase okay and also the community engagement i think that is here to stay i mean we have basic research that has to be done and we have senior design projects that are basic research which is great but the majority of the projects that we have now are have they touch lives they solve community problems here in new mexico and at the same time in africa or no, that, that, middle east that is the future that I, I i love i love that concept you know I, i'm reminded of a, of, a, of a kind of a project we're working on with uh, some faculty at the U university of toronto where you know we, we, we're talking about m making it equitable in different parts of the world so we're pretty you know well off here in canada compared to other parts of the world but by using virtual labs the students are effectively working on the same platform like there's no advantage for one over the other and they can work collaboratively collaborate they can work together because i can't <laughs> get that word out for some reason um they can work together to to to, to come up with the solutions to problems which are important to people in different parts of the world and that's so important i think in terms of empowering people in countries where the finances aren't there you know, India, the, uh, Africa, the examples that we've talked about, some parts of Eastern Europe as well, and Latin America. I mean, there's many places where you take a design engineer from North America to solve a problem. It's like taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut because, you know, no, you can't afford uh, an agricultural machine that's going to cost, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100,000 dollars. It's got to be 10% of that. How do you build it to sell it for 10 or 15,000 dollars? How's that possible? Well, you've got to develop those engineers um, with the support um, of how to go about it, but they have to figure out how they can use local resources, local talent to make it uh, possible for that to happen in their in their in their, in their environment. Um, the, the virtual labs are here to stay, and this is a good mechanism for to address the differences, right? Like you said, between countries, uh, there's yeah. no way. Uh, institutions in Africa or Latin America will access the labs that we have here at UNM. And we're not the big school, right? Uh, so open up these labs so they can come and do their research and uh, and we need that the virtual co connectivity. That can happen, but re that's okay for 80% of the time. But that 20%, they need to come here. And this is the, yes. the future of collaboration, the face to face and get your hands and touch this. We need that. Right. I, I, I want to thank you, Ramiro, once again. I mean, I've always found you inspirational. I mean, we haven't talked about it, but you talked about your young life in Colombia and some stories which maybe we can't share at the Quanta <laughs> Cafe. But, you know, the, you, you've had a colorful life, but you talk about students being able to play, students being able to play to learn. You talked about people telling stories. You talked about um, doing projects with people all over the world and your passion for peace engineering and what it means to the world. I mean, this is not something taken lightly. I know for a fact, you know, five, six, seven years ago, when you were talking about it, people were, they didn't get it. They rolled their eyes and they weren't sure what's this crazy guy talking about. Um, and you've always, and you've always said to me, you know, Paul, you can, you can run, but you can't hide. Um, and then now in this global connected world, <laughs> It's impossible for me to hide from you if I wanted to, which I don't. Um, so I'd like to thank you for taking the time, Romero, to, 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 to join me in this expose, because my hope is these conversations will 
be shared amongst all of the people around the world, not just a bunch of academic leaders. I want regular faculty, students, undergraduates to hear these ideas, what's possible. Um, and, and hopefully some people listening to this will look up Romero Jordan at the University of New Mexico and see what you're doing. They'll learn more about the Peace Engineering Lab and the work you're doing. Um, and like I said, it's been an honor to be friends with you for so long. And hopefully uh, in the not too distant future, I'll be able to come down and see the expanded Y Lab, and we'll be able to talk about what other trouble we can get into. Uh, and 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 for sure, you know, your commitment to taking what's new or what makes sense and building it in. I mean, and I don't want to age you, but you said this is your last project. You're not a young spring chicken, but you've got more energy than most 25 year olds. I have to tell you that. Um, <laughs> so, all that to say, thanks very much, Romero. Thanks for joining. Thank and, you. Um, I, I, thank I, I you all and thank uh, thank the Quanster team. I mean, you're part of the family here, so thank you so much. Yeah, it's been fun over the last number of years, hasn't it? And we'll continue to have that fun. Thanks very much, Romero. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.